Hello everyone, welcome to the ninth installment of Black Cat Theology. I'm Dr. Peter Dillard. Remember the last time we reached a provisional decision about which of the two theological options we have extracted from Heidegger's later writings we should pursue in the rest of the lecture series. Recall that the first theological option is a theology of Streit, where Streit is the German word for struggle. And according to this possible theology, our fundamental experience of God is one of encountering something that's deeply enigmatic, something that is deeply puzzling and paradoxical, with which we must struggle in order to wrest some measure of clarity from it. Whereas the other uh, theological option is a theology of Gelassenheit. Now on this possible theology, where Gelassenheit means in German is letting be. So according to this theological possibility, our fundamental experience of divinity is a kind of tranquilized dwelling or energized tranquility in which we dwell peacefully and in serenity uh, in intimacy with divinity. Our fundamental experience, at least, of divinity is ideally that. But this dwelling is also exciting or in some way charged. So these are the two theological options we identified. Now, let's go to the ledger with which we concluded the last lecture. This ledger gives us the respective strengths and weaknesses of each one of these theological options. So let's briefly review that. In the case of Streit theology, there are two strengths and there are three weaknesses. The first strength is that Streit theology certainly endows our fundamental experience of God or of divinity with rich experiential and phenomenological content. That's the experience of struggling with this divine obscurity in order to find clarity. And the second strength of the strite, theologian, strite theological option is that it certainly doesn't make our experience of divinity something bland and boring. It's, it's very charged. It's very exciting. It's something interesting that can stimulate us. So that's a strength. Now, the three weaknesses of strite theology are, to begin with, it might be that in making... God into something that's deeply enigmatic and obscure with which we have to struggle in order to try to understand it, the strite theologian might make our experience uh, with divinity of divinity and our reckoning with that too difficult. And so we, it might be so difficult that it becomes daunting and overwhelming to the point that we give it up. That would be a drawback. The second weakness of strite theology that we mentioned was that since the Stry theologian identifies our experience of God as some an experience of something that's deeply puzzling or enigmatic, and also sees certain metaphysical problems as deeply puzzling and enigmatic, particularly the ones that the Stry theologian seeks to deconstruct. That line between metaphysical paradoxes that we want to avoid and theological or religious paradoxes that we wish to embrace becomes very unclear. It becomes blurred. Finally, the, the third weakness of Streit theology is that there's no apparent relationship, so far at least, between what we said about this experience of Streit, on the one hand, and the core tenets of the Christian faith, things such as belief in the Incarnation, belief in the Trinity, belief in the Resurrection, and so, so on. So those are the respective strengths and weaknesses of strike theology. That's the side of the ledger pertaining to that theological option. Now let's look at the other side of the ledger, the side that pertains to Gelassenheit theology. And here again, we have two strengths and three weaknesses, but there's some qualifications this time around. So let's begin with the strengths of Gelassenheit theology. First of all, like its strike counterpart, Gelassenheit theology certainly imbues our experience of God with very definite phenomenological content. Tranquilized dwelling or energized tranquility, if you will, that's a very particular experience that we all recognize. And so that makes, in identifying our encounter with God, or describing it in those terms, we, we, we do endow that encounter with very definite experience and content. Secondly, 
Notice that this, the Galassian High Theologian does not take the, our fundamental encounter of God to be an encounter with something that's deeply paradoxical or enigmatic or puzzling. And so, at least in principle, the line between experiencing the holy, or divinity, on the one hand, and wrestling with metaphysical paradox on the other, in Strife theology, that line's clearer, at least prima facie, it's much clearer, because the experience of God, unlike the experience of wrestling with problematic metaphysical paradoxes, the experience of God is not an experience of a paradox. And so that's a strength. Now, what are the three weaknesses? Well, the first weakness is of glass and high theology is that it threatens to make our experience of God something too bland or too uniform and too boring. Because if we all we do in encountering God is to continue this activity of energized tranquility or tranquil dwelling, well, that might get boring eventually, and so we might simply lapse into a kind of indifference about divinity, the holy, and God. So that's a drawback. The second weakness of Galassianite theology is that it's not clear how that theological option can involve deconstructive overkill. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the, the Galassianite theologian wants to deconstruct problematic metaphysical and other philosophical notions that threaten to hamstring our understanding of divinity. But once that deconstructive process is set into motion, who is to say that it won't spill over to affect theological notions and so undermine theology and, and faith insofar as faith needs theology as a sort of reflective uh, self-understanding? How do we know that and how can we be sure that that won't happen? Now, let me say something about those first two weaknesses. I said there were qualifications in each case. The, the qualification to the worry that Galas and high theology might make our experience of divinity too boring is that within the overall experience of Galas and Hyde, or letting be, there is this tension between, on the one hand, the element of tranquility, and on the other hand, this sort of energy, or this energized excitement. And so... Because it's energized tranquility, uh, there's a tension there. And that might militate against the threat of boredom or lapsing into some kind of blandness that, that, that we wish to avoid. That needs to be developed, but at least there's a silver lining there. There's a possible path forward. As far as the second weakness is concerned, the one that there's this threat of deconstructive overkill, remember that the Glassenheit theologian says that there are mutually reciprocal senses in which the non-metaphysical event of being needs the holy and the event of the advent of the holy also needs the non-metaphysical event. The advent of the holy needs the non-metaphysical event in order to avo avoid problematic metaphysical assumptions that, that ham hamstring or threaten to occlude or obscure our experience of divinity, but there's also some sense that's not yet been explicated. There's some sense, at least that Heidegger implies there's some sense, in which the non-metaphysical event, it too needs the holy in order to become sheltered, in order to become divinized. Remember that language that we came across in the Beitrag of Philosophie. And so that again is not something that's been developed yet, but there's another, there's a silver lining there. Again, there's a possible path forward. That leads to the third weakness of Glass and Hyde theology, and that is the same as the third weakness of Strife theology, namely, that so far there's no clear connection or bearing be between the, the experience of Glass and Hyde insofar as it's understood as pertaining to divinity on the one hand, and central or core Christian beliefs. So at the end of the day, we have in each case two weaknesses. And, I'm sorry, we have two strengths and three weaknesses. We have two strengths and three weaknesses for Strife theology, and we have two strengths and three weaknesses for Galassianheit theology. But in the case of Galassianheit theology, the two of the weaknesses are mitigated by there being these silver linings, these possible ways forward. And so in light of that result, 
we then are in a position to make this provisional decision to pursue Gelassenheit theology at least in this course of lecture series and that is what I've done in, in my book on this topic, uh, Non-Metaphysical Theology After Heidegger. That's what I do there. That in no way though is to, meant to prejudice the possibility of developing a strike theology. There no doubt are things that someone who's sympathetic to that theological approach might say and should be encouraged to say and as I said before, the very general theological framework that I am trying to set forth here requires that both of these theological options, and possibly there are others that I don't even know about, they need to be, all of them need to be developed to the uh, greatest extent possible because they all are basically interpretations of a common faith. And so the more theological options we have, the, the more ways we have of understanding the underlying faith. It's like we have more tools in the theological toolbox and that's a good thing. So now, what I want to do in this lecture is begin to introduce some tools that will help us in our subsequent development of Gelassenheit theology and then at the very end I'll say a few things in anticipation of the next lecture. But the tools I have in mind are to be found in Rudolf Otto's very influential book, which in German is called Das Heilige über das Irrationale in der Idee des Göttlichen und sein Verhältnis zum Rationalen. So that's the holy over the irrational and the idea of the holy or the godly and its relation to the rational. So this is a very famous book that has been uh, read and reprinted many times over the decades. Otto was a theologian at Marburg University, and very interestingly, he was there while Heidegger was teaching at Marburg. I believe Heidegger was there from 1923 to 1928 before he made the move to Freiburg University uh, upon the publication and the wide renown of Sein und Zeit being in time. So while Heidegger was there at Marburg in the mid, well, in the 20s, uh, Otto was a colleague. There's no evidence that they actually meant or had any discussion, but there is some evidence that I present in my book. There is some indication that Husserl had discussed Otto's work with Heidegger, and Heidegger was familiar with Otto's work and up to a point sympathetic to it. And so that, that gives us some reason to think that we might be able to find some things in Otto's work that will help us in trying to shed light on this Gelassenheit theological option. Now, what I want to do is just give you the flavor of Otto's analysis. What he wants to do is approach or get clear about, well, what is our experience of the holy? When we talk about the holy or the godly or uh, holiness, what is it when we, when we have an ex what are the experiences that we associate with that? What is it like? to experience the holy or to have a, a purported experience of the holy. So one thing that Otto says there is he begins by talking about the holy in very indefinite terms in which he's trying to avoid reifying it or turning it into some particular object or thing that we can point to and say, oh, there it is, right? So like there's the tree over there and there's there are the clouds up in the sky and then there's the holy. He, he, he wants to provide a sort of clear but not too definite initial approximation of what it's like to feel that one is in the presence of the holy. And so the example he uses is the German phrase, es spukt hier, literally it spooks here or it's haunted here. And he discusses this in connection with the, the episode, the very famous episode in Genesis 28, chapter 28, verse 17, where Jacob, as you may recall, is wrestling with the angel. And so, and there's a ladder that comes down from heaven, and Jacob feels himself to be in the presence of divinity. In fact, let's read that passage very quickly. He says, upon waking from his dream in Bethany, Jacob exclaims, how dreadful is this place? This is none other than the house of Elohim. And so he has this very powerful experience of God's presence in the middle of the night, mediated by these various appearances or phenomena. And so what, what, uh, what Otto says about that is, well, look, 
it's it's like for Jacob, it's like it spooks here. It's it's eerie here. It's eerie here. Maybe that's a better English equivalent. And what's important to keep in mind there is that there's a parallel between that form of words. You know, it's eerie here or es spukt hier, on the one hand, and things like when we talk about certain atmospheric conditions, like well, it's 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 raining now, or it's cold here, or it's hot there. Okay, in those forms of linguistic expression, the it in the sentence doesn't refer to any particular object or being or something that we could point to and say, yeah, there's the it that's raining. It's simply a way of demarcating this atmospheric condition without making any definite ontological commitment yet to what kind of thing it is. Now, this is a very promising point that we come across in Otto, because remember that it's very crucial it's crucial to the theological underpinning of not only of Galassenheit theology, but also of Streit theology. It's very crucial that the holy, recall, is neither any particular being nor some characteristic of being or the non-metaphysical event of being itself. It's not any particular being or object. That fits very nicely with this point that Otto makes about es spukt hier. It's eerie here. It's holy here. It's godly here. That's a very interesting parallel. So that makes Otto's work a promising resource for the Galassenheit theologian. That's one thing. Now let's dig a little bit deeper into Otto's phenomenology of the holy. He's operating within a what we might say a very broadly Husserlian framework, where this is the framework that Husserl develops in the Lergische Untersuchungen, the, the logical investigations in his early phenomenology, where he sets forth various basic structures that seem to be common to all human experience that's, that purports to be about something. And that relation of purporting to be about something that an experience has is called intentionality. It's a kind of directedness at something, even if the something isn't really out there, the experience purports to be of something that really is out there. So that purporting to be of something out there or to be about something out there is intentionality. Now, within an intentional experience, according to Husserl, there are two poles. On the one hand, there's the active experiencing itself and the feelings and the various subjective quality, psychological states and other tones that may go along with it. So that's what Husserl refers to as the noesis, N-O-E-S-I-S, the noesis. So that's the act of experiencing itself with all of its psychological uh, and, and uh, sub subjective concomitants. Then there is the noema. There's, that's the purported object, or, and I'm using object very loosely here. It could be anything. It, might, it, it is, purports to be something real or something out there. So the purported object, in this minimal sense of object, of an intentional experience is the noema, or N-O-E-M-A. So for example, if I have an experience, uh, I'm afraid because I have an experience, let's say, of... I don't know, let's say I have an experience of a wolf and I become afraid. Okay, my experience, the, the, the subjective quality of that experience, my fear and the various visual experiences, I'm, qualities that I may have, that things that may be going on in my sense organs, that's part of the noesis, whereas the purported thing or reality that my experience is directed towards, the noema, is the wolf. Maybe it's not out there. It may be an illusion. I may be under some kind of delusion or something like that, but it could also be out there. Even if it's not really out there, it looks as if it is. It purports to be out there. So that's the noema, the noesis-noema distinction that is familiar from Husserl. And not only in the early works, even later in Ideen and the, the uh, more transcendental version of Husserlian the phenomenology. Now, in his phenomenology of the holy, Otto takes over this distinction. He gives it a slightly different name, but he refers to the numinous pole and the numen pole of overall numinal experience. So numinal experience overall, that's intentional because it purports to be about something out there. When Jacob is there at you know, in the night and he's confronting these various things, 
it, and he has this feeling of something strange or holy and eerie, that's something that purports to be out there, out there. He can look towards it or it's, you know, it's somewhere out there in the environment all around him. And he has these various feelings of awe or fear or these psychological states that are directed toward this awesome holy presence that purports to be out there. So for Otto, the two poles of numal experience are the numinous, that's the, the act of experiencing the holy, and then the holy numen, the numen, which is the holy that purports to be out there at which the experience purports to be directed. So that's a piece of apparatus that we're going to want to come back to, and it may be useful in helping us develop Heidegger's uh, the glass and height theological option. Now, let's, let's look at the, the Newman for a minute, the holy, and, and let's look at two aspects, two very, very general aspects that Otto distinguishes in his phenomenology of the holy Newman. There are two of them. One of them he calls Mysterium Tremendum. Mysterium Tremendum. And this is when the holy appears to us as something a little bit frightening, awful. It's something mysterious and tremendous and a little scary, right? So this is the Mysterium Tremendum, and the Newman, the Holy Newman, appears under this aspect or as possessing this attribute or these properties. And Otto goes on to, to break down Mysterium Tremendum into to three different aspects. There's this aspect of off, the, the Newman appears to us as as a kind of awfulness, and that has a concomitant experience in us that we can think of. It also appears to us as overpowering, overwhelming, and as possessing a kind of dynamism or energy. So awfulness, overpoweringness, and energy are the three uh, aspects of the noumenal attribute of Mysterium Tremendum. So those are three different components or three different aspects that the Newman appears to have to which we respond with awe or fear, a little bit of fear, or maybe a little bit of excitement because there's this, this sense that there's this energized thing out there that is seeking us out. Okay, so that's the first attribute of the Holy Newman, Mysterium Tremendum, according to Otto. The second one is Mysterium Fascinans, and this is a kind of yearning for the the Newman, the Holy Newman. This is being drawn towards it. It's not so much, it's not that one is afraid or taken aback or overawed by it. It's that someone wishes to draw closer to it, is desiring and yearning for it and yearning to be in union with it. And here again, Otto distinguishes a number of moments within this Newmanal attribute of Mysterium Fascinans, he, two in particular. There's a, the, the Newman, the Newmanal, the Newman, the Newmanal object of the Holy shows up as something wonderful. It's something, something beautiful or wonderful or very positive. And then there's also a kind of longing. It shows up as something that's worthy of being desired, for which we long. It's worthy of being longed for. And so we have concomitant numinous experiences. Uh, you know, very pleasant feelings in the face of the wonderful and of this desire to be united with it as it shows up as something for us that, that is worthy of being uh, attained in some sense. So those are the various as mo uh, moments within the second noumenal attribute of Mysterium Fascinans. Uh, Fascinans. Now, what's important here is that we seem to have a parallel uh, between Otto's phenomenology of the holy and this notion of this overall experience of Gelassenheit or letting be, where that's a kind of energized tranquility. The tranquil part within the Gelassenheit, overall Gelassenheit experience, corresponds to Mysterium Fascinans, this desire to be united with this and to find peace by being united with this noumenal, this holy noumen, this holy noumenal object. And on the other hand, the energized part of the overall Galassenheit experience, that would seem to correspond to Mysterium Tremendum, where, remember, one of the moments within that noumenal attribute is energy and excitement. Now, what's important here is that if we have, within the overall experience, 
of Gelassenheit, coordinated now, coordinated now with Otto's phenomenology of the holy, we have these two sort of push-pull things. There's the kind of the awe in the face of God as something scary and eerie that pushes us away. But then there's also this desire, this longing that draws us to it. There's a kind of push and pull here that might be interwoven in very helpful ways with human action and decision-making. So that then our encounter with the holy is not just going to be something facing something that's very beautiful and bland and that we finally get bored with it, but it's something that has this kind of push-pull tension between the tranquilized element and the energized element, the element that draws us to it and the other element that sort of pushes us away from it a little bit. That's a good thing because then we have possibly resources and tools that we can use to flesh out how human beings interact with the holy. And that's something that we're going to want to try to do in a later lecture. Now, that's all I want to do today. Next time, we're going to come back to Otto, and I want to focus in on a problem. I don't want to say too much about it right now because we've already, I've already gone at, on at length somewhat. But we're going to see that within Otto, there's a tension about, well, there's a, there's a question about whether Otto has really avoided metaphysical perplexity. If he hasn't, then obviously that would cripple any attempt to utilize his phenomenology in order to, to develop his phenomenology of the holy, in order to develop an account of glass and high theology. So let's leave it there. I want to leave that hanging, and I don't want to say anything else about it. I hope that you will join me again next time. I think that we're beginning to pick up momentum now. We are starting to go in a very particular direction that I'm pleased with, and I hope that you are as well. Please, again, feel free to, to leave any questions here uh, on the YouTube channel that I have, and I will do my best to answer them. Until next time, this is Dr. Peter Dillard signing off for Black Cat Theology. Thank you very much for joining me today.